Now, that was I know that was a bit a bit complex, but now with the uh, DSP based uh, spectrum analyzer, you'll notice that it's it's a lot it appears a lot simpler. That the IF the IF frequency is digitized by the analog to digital converter at a rate of at least twice the frequency of the higher IF frequency. The digital signal processor amp applies mathematical routines to the data to format and extract the needed results. Now the thing is, this is, this is extremely useful uh, or extremely powerful because the thing is, it's just software. The hardware constraints for resolution and video bandwidth detector and log processing are reduced to mathematical equations. The sweep of the spectrum analyzer is incremented in steps approximately, and this is approximately equal to the IF bandwidth. So this is a this is a typical uh, face of a, a spectrum analyzer. What you're going to have is you have your uh, your main power switch to turn on your uh, to turn on your unit, and on the 8821QR, it has a uh, color LCD display. Then you have your uh, uh, number three your your USB port. USB port is mainly for uh, for transferring files. It allows you to put a memory stick on uh, on that particular port, and you can save files uh, based off of the uh, off of the USB routing. You have your soft keys. When your display is illuminated, the soft keys have uh, different uh, different things that you can select from that takes you into different options. You also have a cal out. That's the calibration signal output. That's number five there. On the 8821QR, it puts out a uh, 150 megahertz uh, signal at 28.7 dBmV. So this allows you to uh, to keep your your analyzer calibrated by running a known signal source back into the analyzer and then the analyzer has the ability of, of setting up or making sure that the analyzer is reading properly. You have a tracking generator output which is number six. The tracking generator allows you to sweep from uh, one meg to one gig. Uh, frequency range and then it, it sends out a, a signal level from a minus five to a 43 dBmV uh, which is the range for that uh, for the uh, signal level that's coming out of there. This is very useful for uh, sweeping, looking at the frequency response of, of traps or, or to see if your taps are rolling off, or looking at diplex filters to see where your roll-offs are, different things like that. Excellent for bench testing. Then you have your RF input, 75 ohm uh, RF input. And then you have your uh, user interface number eight, which is where you control all of your uh, your different measurements and uh, where you punch in your numbers and so on. Now the back of the unit has uh, number one; it's just your your serial tag, uh, uh, your serial number. But then number two, you have a, a LAN port an RJ45 port, this allows your analyzer to, uh, to be controlled remotely. It allows your analyzer to go online or to where you can view it from an online state. You have, uh, uh, this, is, this has uh, video ports, a number three and an S video port. And these aren't used in uh, this particular version, but one thing that, uh, that we do with the analyzer, we, uh, we leave uh, lots of room for expansion. So we uh, always want to give, give room so that we can continue to build on this particular product line. Also, you have a, a v 
VGA or a monitor out, number five. Number six is a COM port, which now that uh, the analyzer uses the, uh, the USB ports and you have your uh, LAN access, then there's uh, not a need for uh, uh, using the actual serial port. And you'll, you're, you've probably noticed that even on, on uh, laptops today and PCs that more and more you uh, don't have serial ports. So we do a lot through a USB and uh, using the Ethernet port. Parallel connection uh, or a parallel port for uh, a printer. Which is the same thing if for, uh, for printing, you're usually going to print directly to your software or through your software, and then you're going to print from your uh, PC uh, uh, in most cases. This does have a uh, standard keyboard, a PS2 port that's on there. Your uh, number 10, that's your charger port. That's where, uh, where you will uh, uh, charge, up your, charge up your analyzer because your analyzer is, uh, has a, a full battery in it that allows you to use this unit either on power or off of power. Number 11 is the fan. It does have a built-in fan to keep the, uh, uh, the unit from overheating. It is, has the ability of pulling, pulling that heat out of the uh, unit so it keeps the unit running cool. And then you have the, uh, the number 12, which is the chassis ground. And I think I mentioned the number 9, but if I didn't, the number 9 is the uh, power supply on-off switch that actually turns off the, the actual power supply itself. Remember you had a, you had a, a power switch that was on your front panel uh, that turned off the unit, uh, so it, put it, it actually put it into a standby mode. And then your power supply, if you want to shut the entire analyzer down, you want to turn that off from the back, which is the number nine. So some of the things, uh, as you start using the spectrum analyzer that you're going to, uh, to see, see a lot on the display, you're going to see uh, the reference slash input, your input level that's coming into into your analyzer. The thing is, that's important uh, important to know. And we're going to talk about it a little bit further as we go on. That if your input levels are set too high, you can overload the uh, the analyzer. But then, if it's set too low, you could uh, uh, get inaccurate readings because you're too close to the noise floor. There's detectors that detects the signals that are coming in. Sweep time, that's how quick your, uh, uh, you will look at the frequency ranges. And it sweeps through the uh, frequency range that are set up. Your resolution bandwidth. Resolution bandwidth allows you to look at closer space carriers together. DB per division, that's how far the graticules or the individual boxes that are on the screen, how far they are apart, whether it's 10 dB apart or it's, uh, or it's 5 dB apart. Uh, that shows, uh, that increases your, uh, you know, how well you're able to see what is happening in that particular frequency range that you're measuring. The frequency tuning. That just actually changes your frequency. And then you also have max holds and min holds, and, uh, which are your minimum levels. Your max hold holds the, the whatever the uh, highest amplitude is on the analyzer. It's going to hold that in place. Now, this is a typical spectrum analyze, analyzer display. Um, I'll just briefly go through uh, what you will see as you navigate around the screen or as you uh, look around the screen of a, a spectrum analyzer. Starting number one is the uh, date that displays the current date. The number two is the uh, log line mode, which that displays the amplitude or displays whether the amplitude is uh, currently shown in either logarithmic or linear mode. There's the time, the current time. The uh, number four is the amplitude scale. 
displays that uh, current amplitude scale. The detector mode uh, displays whether the detector mode is currently enabled or not. Number six, the detector type displays the type of detector that is currently enabled. The display screen, number seven, displays the current user inner title of the display screen. Number eight, the marker frequency just displays what frequency the selected marker is. You have your number nine, which is your uh, marker amplitude. Shows the actual uh, uh, the level of your marker, the amplitude of the markers. The number ten, the uncal measurement. When it says uncal, that means that uh, that particular uh, uh, measurement is uncalibrated. It's an uncalibrated configuration. Number 11 is your soft menus that uh, whenever you select the, uh, the soft key that's next to that particular menu, it will actually uh, pick that particular item. The number 12, the reference level, shows the 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 reference the top of the screen or the top graticule of the uh, screen your uh, active function area and that's used to display the currently active function as well as uh, the user entered values then you have your waveforms displays the waveform that's currently being measured Number 15, the display line delta, it uh, uh, shows a change at the display line between the current waveform to the waveform that is memorized when the display line delta function is turned on. You have the position of the display line shows the current value of the display line. The center frequency is just a center frequency uh, uh, that you have. Uh, that you have depicted in that particular display, the resolution bandwidth, that RBW, that's how close your, uh, the detectors are, how you're able to measure your, uh, your carriers, and then your video bandwidth displays the current video bandwidth filter frequency. The span, that's the current span that you have set up on your analyzer. The sweep time displays the current selected sweep time required to make a sweep of that particular display. The tracking generator displays whether the tracking uh, generator is currently enabled or not. The attenuator level displays the current attenuator level. You have your uh, battery slash charging status, which displays the voltage status of the uh, battery. And also let you know if the battery is uh, charging. The preamplifier status it lets you know if the uh, if the amplifier, the internal amplifier, is currently enabled or not. And then the fan status lets you know if the uh, fan is currently running. That's important because you want to make sure that your analyzer does not overheat. So now let's talk about actually making uh, analyzer measurements. Now, when you're uh, making uh, noise power measurements, the noise power contains all of the frequencies. Now, the FCC requires that the noise uh, is measured in a 4 meg bandwidth. And this simulates the noise power received uh, in a television. Uh, up to 4 meg is where your uh, video information is, because remember, your uh, audio carrier picks up at 4.5 meg below the video carrier. Measuring the uh, power with the spectrum analyzer, the spectrum analyzer uh, resolution filter acts as the noise filter. Now, it's not a square wave or not a square filter, so corrections has to be made. Another correction is made because the analyzer does not have a 4 meg wide filter. So correcting analyzer noise power measurements, use a 30 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. You want to add 21.25 for the noise uh, to the, you want to add that to the noise to correct for that 4 meg bandwidth, and then add 
two and a half dB because the spectrum analyzer is not a perfectly not a perfect voltmeter. So your actual total noise correction is 23.75, which we'll uh, mention this number a little bit later again. So now one of the things that I see a lot of times when I'm doing training uh, or doing spectrum analyzer training is that uh, the measurements that, that are uh, being looked at are not accurate measurements. And the reason that it's not accurate is, is that there's times that you, you may think think that you're looking at the uh, the noise floor of your plant, but really you're looking at the noise floor of the analyzer. Now the way that you can determine if you're looking at the noise floor of the analyzer or if it's noise floor of the plant is doing what's called the disconnect test. And what the disconnect test is, it just allows you to make a correction, a correction that's based off of, of how far the signal level drops or the noise floor drops from uh, where your plant noise floor is to where the analyzer noise floor is. If you look at this particular graph, it shows on the uh, on the on the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, that uh, the numbers across there is for your noise drop for the uh, disconnect test, and then your vertical axis or your y-axis is the uh, noise near noise correction. So, for example, if you looked all the way to the uh, to the far right side, you see that there's a uh, there's a uh, a point right at you know, it's it looks like that the uh, the actual drop was about a half half a, uh, or the drop was 10 dB it's all the way at the far right scale because it's all the way at the far right scale it's really letting you know that there's not much uh, corrections that has to be made that that measurement is with is going to be within a half a dB so you don't have to uh, make any corrections but let's say if it only if it dropped uh, a 5 dB, then you see that it's between 1 and 2, closer to 2 dB of correction it needs to uh, make, and so on. If it was a 1 dB drop of the uh, noise floor, then there's actually close to 7 dB of uh, correction that has to be made. Just remember, to get your, uh, your, your noise floor uh, uh, out of or further away from your noise floor of your analyzer, you can use a preamp. Sometimes it's necessary when using a preamp to use a bandpass filter as well. I always recommend, you know, if all possible, using bandpass filters. If the noise floor increases more than the gain of the preamp, then that particular preamp may be causing uh, some uh, distortions or beats in that particular frequency range or that frequency that's being measured. So this gives another view of how to look at your uh, your noise, uh, near noise, or the corrections that has to be made on the analyzer. If you look at the top, if your if your system noise is um, uh, if it's when you disconnect your input going into your analyzer, if the noise floor drops by 10 dB, then there's really not much correction that needs to be made. It's going to be within a half a dB. If when you pull the, uh, the, or disconnect the input from the analyzer and it drops 6 dB, then there's a 1.2 dB correction. If it drops only by 3, then there's a 3 dB correction that needs to be made. If it only drops by a, a dB, then your measurements could be off by as much as 7 dB. There's a 7 dB correction that needs to be made. So just kind of a summary of your analyzer corrections. You want to make the corrections for, uh, since your uh, analyzer is not a uh, voltmeter, and uh, then for your bandwidth correction that, because it's not a, uh, a, square, a square filter, then you want to add 23.75. And then you want to do your disconnect test, and then subtract the value on the graph. And then, Use a preamp in order to get your uh, uh, out of the noise floor further. The analyzers like the 8821QR uh, has a uh, built-in uh, preamp as well. 
So kind of if you're wanting to make a quick composite carry to noise measurement, a way that you could do it is, you know, measure the, uh, the peak of the carrier in a 300 kilohertz resolution bandwidth, a resolution and video bandwidths. And then you want to set the bandwidth to 30 kilohertz and set the video bandwidth to 100 hertz to measure the noise. And then if you measure, you can measure the noise at 1.2 meg below the picture carrier, below the video, the uh, uh, center frequency of the video carrier. And then do your disconnect test to make sure that you're truly looking at the noise floor. Your results are worst case. So if your carrier is uh, 36 dBmV, if the noise is uh, minus 37.58, you want to add 23.75 for the noise correction. You want to disconnect the, uh, uh, if it was a, uh, if it only dropped by 6 dB, then you want to uh, subtract 1 dB for your, uh, uh, you know, because your disconnect test or for the, uh, uh, the more accuracy. And then if the noise is a minus 14, 0.83 dBmV, then your actual carrier to noise is 50.83 dB at 4 meg. So the FCC uh, composite carrier to noise measurement requires that you turn your video modulation off and you measure within the video frequency range at 4 meg. Now, there are automated ways to make your uh, measurements. You can do what's called gated measurements, which allows the analyzer to tune to a, uh, a line that is deleted or a blank line, and it uh, looks at the noise floor at that particular point. So it, uh, it, you don't cause interference with the customer, because remember, uh, when you're doing the measurements by removing modulation, you're removing all of the picture content, uh, so it causes uh, a disruption. This will actually allow you to keep the channel online, and by installing a piece of equip equipment in the head end, that allows you to, to uh, blank individual lines, then you can select the line that has you know, uh, no information on it, and you can make the measurement off of there. And then you pre you can preamp uh, uh, you know if it's needed to get further out of the noise floor, and you want to make sure that you're not overloading the analyzer because it can cause beats to pop up in there, and you'll get inaccurate readings. Now the uh, com uh, composite carry to noise uh, test in the 8821QR has a built-in accuracy evaluation, so it looks at at, uh, or it verifies that you are making an accurate measurement before it actually takes it. Otherwise, it will show that it's not, it's not a calibrated measurement. So this is, kinda, this is a block diagram of, of how the, uh, your carrier to noise, your composite carrier to noise measurement is made. So let's say you're measuring your, your carrier to noise. You would check your analyzer noise correction value if when you disconnect the input from the analyzer, if it drops by 10 dB, then you're done. You go ahead and make the measurement, and, uh, and it's complete. And, you know, for the most accuracy, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you'd want to use a bandpass filter. Now, if you measure the carrier to noise, and when you do a, a drop, it's not dropping, you know, to the, uh, you know, at that 10 dB drop, then you want to use a bandpass filter. You know, put on a, a external amplifier, or use the a preamp in the analyzer. And uh, once you once you add the bandpass filter on it, make the carrier to noise measurement again. If it does, if you get that 10 dB drop, then you know that you're uh, looking good and your measurement is complete. Now, if you remember, that was the automated way of making the uh, the measurement. If you were going to do it manually, 
You want to measure for your uh, carotenoids. Look for the noise drop. If it drops by 10, then your measurements are complete. If it drops by, uh, if it's greater than a 3 dB drop but less than a 10, then you want to calculate the correction. You want to put that correction factor in there, and then the measurement is complete. If it, if it drops less than 3 dB, then you want to decrease the analyzer attenuation so that it brings the carrier up further. And if you, if there's no uh, a step, if there's no attenuation, if it's already with uh, zero dB of attenuation in there, then you need to add a preamp, put a bandpass filter on it, and then make the measurement again, and then you know follow the uh, the block diagram accordingly. When you're making measurements uh, with the with the analyzer. If it's a uh, 1 dB of correction, then your, uh, uh, your results will actually be good results. It's within 1 dB. If it's a 3 dB correction, it's plus or minus 2. If it's a 7 dB correction, it's 3.5. So you want to make sure that you, you, get up, you get your levels up, up higher so that it gets out of the noise floor. For the, uh, for the most accurate results. So analog distortion measurements. The FCC requires uh, for coherent disturbances that uh, the spec is that it needs to be 51 dB or greater. And what you're going to see on the pictures, uh, uh, if you're having uh, problems with uh, CSO, that composite second order or composite triple beat, you'll see uh, lines in the picture, horizontal kind of herringbone patterns uh, on the picture. The accuracy of the analyzer is plus or minus 1.5 dB. And just remember the measurements are made uh, based off of the number of subscribers uh, that you that you have determines your number of test points that has to be measured. When you're setting up your analyzer, you want to center on the carrier that you're measuring. You know, span it at the six meg. Uh, resolution bandwidth is 300 kilohertz. Video bandwidth 300 kilohertz. Sweep time I would just set it at you know just automatic uh, on auto. And um, and your uh, 10 dB. Uh, uh, per division and so on, and then that'll give you give you what you're you know that you're you know ensure that you're making an accurate measurement. Don't forget the drop or to do the disconnect test. So in this section, what we're going to uh, talk about is is the sources of distortions, how distortion appears on uh, on the TV, the second and third order beats that's at CSO and CTB, what composite really means quick and practical tips, and some hands-on experience with uh, manual and automated uh, measurements. So coherent disturbances, which are uh, beats, uh, uh, which is that CSO and CTB, that comes from uh, just, just frequencies of channels being combined together. When you combine uh, channels, they cast beats in, in particular known locations. And that's what you'll uh, see with your CSO and CTB. Second order distortions uh, are, are the CSOs. Third order distortions is composite triple beat. The thing is, whenever, whenever you run uh, signals through amplifiers, that not only are you amplifying, amplifying the signal, you're also amp you're, uh, causing or amplifying the noise floor as well, which is the reason that we talk so much about unity gain to where you're actually balancing uh, uh, based off of what your uh, signal loss is or taking into account what your loss is from one point to the next and uh, then making the measurements according opposed to if you have you know uh, additional cable loss changing your pads in order to achieve your output so you don't want to balance for the output you you really balance for the input of the amplifier
when you see CSOs uh, on a, a television looking at an analog channel, a CSO looks like a herringbone pattern. When you have composite triple beat, it looks like horizontal lines that's on the screen. You'll just have those horizontal lines across the screen. Composite distortion. The fewer the channels, the less composite distortion. And many distortion products fall, fall on a single frequency. And it's a summation of these, uh, these beats or uh, the distortions, and that's what's called the composite. Composite beats are like a, a noise signal. It's like a, a noise signal source that's there. And the reason that, I mean, you, the more channels that you, uh, that you start having, I mean, our channel capacities now, they go up pretty high. You know, some areas is, is you know, up to a gig of channel uh, capacities. And with the uh, channels uh, together like that, that's one of the reasons that you notice that your, uh, that your trunk cascades are getting smaller and smaller. It's all because of the fact that there's so many channels. And as you, start, as you amplify them any time, it increases the amount of distortions. And uh, you'll never be able to meet your in the lines uh, distortion-wise uh, because of uh, the number of channels that are carried. CSO and CTB, it, it actually manifests in uh, different areas. Your, uh, your CTB falls directly under the video carrier, and the CSO falls to the side of the video carrier or to the skirt of the video carrier. Like I said, your FCC compliance for a non-coherent system uh, uh, frequencies is 51 uh, dB. Uh, your, uh, it's 47 for coherent systems. So here's where your, where your carriers fall. And this is for uh, standard frequencies, uh, uh, so not necessarily for if you have like an HRC system or something like that, but for a standard NCTA system that uh, CTB falls directly under, under the video carrier. Your uh, CSO, CSO falls at 0.75 and 1.25, both above and below the video carrier. So some of your uh, measurement procedures uh, measure CSO and CTB just like, a, uh, like you would measure a, a CW signal, a, a constant wave, just a standard carrier. Average the amplitude, treat low-level signals just like noise, and then correct as noise signal in uh, a composite carrier to noise measurement. So you do the same noise corrections. You still do your, uh, your disconnect test. You want to prevent overloading. You can overload your analyzer. A way, a, a, a typical setup for uh, making the measurements, you have your uh, cable coming from your tap, have a, a step attenuator so that you're able to adjust the levels going into your analyzer. If you have a, a tunable bandpass filter, that's uh, uh, recommended for making measurements so you're uh, measuring just that particular channel, not looking at the uh, energy that's coming from all of the adjacents. Use a preamp if you need to, and then make your measurement. Now, one of the ways that you can make a, uh, or measure CSO without turning off the modulation is measuring at the, uh, the peak of your, uh, your uh, video carrier. And then you can look at the, at the, uh, you know, the lower. If, if, if you're measuring channel 2, you can look below channel 2, and it'll give you the noise floor below channel 2. And remember the values of worst case, you could do the same thing between channel 4 and 5 because there's that, that open space there. Uh, if it's not occupied, a lot of times it's occupied with whether it's uh, uh, return carriers for below channel 2 or, uh, uh, you know, different other, uh, 
you know, telemetry carriers between channel four and five. But you can uh, make a measurement there as well to, uh, uh, if you want to get a quick measurement without turning off the modulation. So here's the uh, measurement procedures for for uh, looking for your distortion or making a noise or distortion measurement. You want to measure the carrier peak, then turn off modulation, set 30 kilohertz resolution bandwidth, and then narrow your video bandwidth to 100 hertz. Composite level using your markers. So look at the composite level using your marker. CSO or CTB equals the peak of the video carrier minus your distortion level or where the beat is. And automatic uh, uh, cable analyzers like the 8821QR can make the uh, CSO measurements without interrupting the subscriber at all. So the distortion summaries. Known frequencies, your beats fall at specific spots for CSO, CTB. Remember, your CTB falls directly up under the uh, video carrier. Your uh, CSOs fall at 0.75 or 1.25 above or below the uh, video carrier. You want to measure the uh, relative. Uh, you want to make your measurement relative to the visual or your video carrier's amplitude, the peak of the video carrier, and your uh, modulation uh, I, uh, needs to be turned off in order to make that accurate measurement. Unless you're using your automated uh, functions like uh, your line, looking at the individual lines, and so on, doing a gated measurement. So now, uh, all of or the majority of the measurements that you make uh, directly off of the analyzer, you can make the similar measurements remote. Now, this is useful. Just one, you have you have more control or an easier control over the analyzer, and the analyzer can be controlled by your uh, by your PC or by uh, uh, you know whatever's tied to to that particular IP address. Also, it's a, a good feature to have uh, uh, doing the remote if you wanted to leave your analyzer set up in the head end you could do uh, measurements remote, especially looking at uh, like the noise floor or you know where you, the peak of the noise is. You can look at those things uh, remotely. So you have the ability of doing auto testing. So you can do your auto testing uh, uh, remotely or using your or setting up your analyzer uh, uh, with with auto test macros that allows you or allows the analyzer to do the uh, test for you automatically, like it can automatically go through and do your distortion test and uh, look at the line that uh, that you already you know uh, provided as a blank line, make the measurement for you, uh, scan all of your channels, uh, uh, looking all the way across, and then at the end of of your testing procedures. It'll give you what your results are, and you're able to file that with the FCC. We talked about the uh, the uh, composite carrier to noise. You can make that measurement directly uh, using the software, and it's a software. I mean, it, it's going to give you a lot more. Uh, uh, it makes it a lot more user friendly when you use the software. It's designed to do these type of tests for you. Your depth of modulation, you could see that directly on the, on the, with the software. It also has a kinescope. Now what this is, now this is actually a very slick feature. This allows the analyzer or the a software to capture or record events in a time frame. So what it does is you can play back what the noise was at a particular time interval. And that's, I, I see a lot of people uh, using that. Let's say if you have a, a, uh, one of your, 
one of your returns are, you know, constantly is going up or down or, you know, it's constantly the noise floor is, is, is elevating and so on, what you could do is with the akinoscope, you could go in and you could capture that over a time period, and then it'll play back those particular uh, those particular slides or those particular uh, uh, snapshots. And also, when you're looking at your uh, your remote, it gives you the ability. Of, of looking at or setting uh, particular measurement lines so that you could go and see, you know, when, you're, when the noise floor peaks up above a particular point. You know, go ahead and set the line on your software, and then you can monitor what's going on with that particular noise floor. You can make all of those, uh, all of the measurements from the, uh, using the remote. And then setting multiple markers, if you know that your uh, modem carriers in your return is at a certain spot, then you can mark, you can put a marker there so you know that in that particular area, I know that I, I have to have that clean because any noise in there is going to impact my return or it's going to impact my cable modems, so I want to make sure that's as clean as possible. Also, you can use your markers if you're, if you're doing a uh, distortion test and you're looking at beats that are falling, falling off your video carrier. See if it's at, you know, you know 1.25 off of your video carrier because then that can let you know that, hey, that's, that looks like that may be a little bit of CSO there, and you can uh, make the corrections as, uh, as necessary. And then the other one that's, uh, uh, that you'd want to use for the software, plus many more things that the uh, software offers you, is uh, a full-spectrum display looking all the way up to a gig, going and looking at all of your channels, what's happening in there, whether it's your, uh, your video, your, uh, um, you know, if it's digital, your, your returns. You can look at that all on, uh, on one spectrum. And then if you do see some anomalies, you can go in or you can drill into it a little bit further and uh, and find what the problem what the problem is. You have you have certain uh, uh, selections when you're when you're toggling through your uh, your software. You have your spectrum display, which shows you all of your uh, uh, you know setting your your frequencies, your center, your span, looking at the uh, the total frequency uh, uh, range. Your uh, CATV tab uh, on the, in the uh, software allows you to do some of the your automated testing. It allows you to uh, to uh, check your or, or put in individual channel numbers and pull up pull up an individual channels and you know uh, quite a bit of other things. But then you also have your your DTV, which is for your digital measurements. That'll show you your QAM, your uh, equalizers. It'll go into your uh, constellation and so on for your digital. This is an example of a clean return. If you notice that the noise floor is uh, is down pretty far from where your uh, where it's, this is probably a modem burst that's happening there, it's down pretty far. So it's looking that's a pretty good return. But now let me show you a contrast of what it would look like if it's a bad return. Notice how your noise floor is a lot higher. It's a lot higher. You still have your modal carrier at the same spot, but your noise is, is up high enough that that would probably start knocking that modem out. Those are the things that you want to capture, and you can capture it very easily using your remote if you're plugged into that return, especially if it's an, an intermittent type return. Then uh, you could just uh, look at it from remote using the uh, QLabs software, and it will show you exactly what's happening. Now as a summary, there is a need to uh, view signals in the time, frequency, or modulation domains. Design and troubleshooting could not be done on today's complex communication systems without capable tools. Spectrum analyzers cover a wide range of frequencies and amplitude range using mixers and logarithmic display scales. Digital signal processors, uh, base spectrum analyzers, have simpler hardware. They consume less power, 
and provide more results faster than swept tuned spectrum analyzers. And then with the added benefit of the remote control software, it makes your total troubleshooting a whole lot easier. Now, I know that we covered a whole lot of information. Uh, uh, some of it went uh, uh, deeper into theories, and then some of it went into uh, practical uses for uh, checking your your distortion measurements and uh, doing a portion of your uh, proof of performance testing we covered and then also you know just talking about the remote capabilities now I'll go ahead and respond to uh, some of your questions that were chatted okay now just remember that this uh, this particular session was designed more to uh, to give you an understanding of how how your uh, of of how the uh, spectrum analyzer how it actually works and and what are some of the you know some of the things that gives you the gives you the most benefit when you're uh, when you're making the test using an analyzer. Uh, now there was a, a couple of questions that uh, came past. Uh, one was uh, what would be the best DBMV to hit the spectrum analyzer uh, with looking at us at a single channel understand when you're uh, the the analyzer itself because it has it has built-in pads and it also has a preamps then the level is is adjustable if you're using your automatic attenuation what happens is is that if you if you happen to uh, uh, hit the hit the level especially looking at at the noise floor and if you're not adjusting the amp properly or doing the noise test that's when you're going to have more uh, distortion issues and things of that nature hopefully that kind of answered the question so in a in a nutshell for a single channel uh, uh, if you have your uh, if you have its your analyzer set to where it's automatically adjusting for attenuation then there shouldn't be an issue with uh, with uh, having to adjust for your uh, signal levels, it's only when you're when you're looking at it in the uh, spectrum analyzer mode that that's when you need to uh, to watch to make sure your noise floor is separated enough. Let me see. Would would any signal above the uh, diplex filter range possibly be a laser clipping while looking at the return at the head end? And then you know, do you have uh, are some examples of what laser clipping looks like? That's actually a good question. Laser clipping, when you start talking about uh, that from a return standpoint, that whenever, whenever there's a, a, a maximum amount of energy that goes uh, beyond, uh, beyond what the uh, laser respect for, it will clip. When you start talking about uh, how or uh, what laser clipping looks like, kind of, uh, you can kind of imagine it as uh, if you overloaded a overloaded an amplifier, you'll see you'll see uh, the noise floor. It appear to be elevated and and a lot of choppy or peaks coming off of it, and uh, and it'll show it'll show that it's clipping. You'll also see uh, with different with different types of uh, return uh, software that it'll it'll display it uh, differently as well. Sometimes it looks like it'll it's kind of uh, uh, um, kind of rounding off the edges of your uh, of your noise floor when you're looking at it off of a uh, off of monitoring equipment, but in essence, what it's going to look like is an amplifier that's being overloaded. So you're going to see a, a you're going to see a noise floor with a lot of uh, uh, distortions or beats that's coming off of it. Let's see, does uh, trilithic cell noise or channel blockers uh, for quiet line testing? Unfortunately, we don't. If you want to uh, uh, send me an email um, um, offline, my information is uh, is on the screen. Uh, you can send it. You can send it directly to either the support at uh, trilithic.com that request, or you can send it directly to me. My email address is tholmes at trilithic.com, and you should get a uh, an email. Um, uh, 
you hear a little bit later that I give you that information again, but you can send that request to me and there's uh, some places that you can get that from uh, to delete the lines. And then it has, uh, uh, will this uh, seminar be available uh, offline or, or after this is over? I did record uh, this session here, so uh, I will uh, uh, post it online and there will be a link available. If anyone is wanting, a, uh, wanting that link, feel free to send me an email and I can get that off to you uh, as quick as I can. Um, other than that, just remember, with the, uh, with the Spectrum Analyzer, I kind of said this earlier, but it, it kind of bears uh, uh, the need for repeating, is, is that, that the analyzer is only going to do what you tell it to do. If you, if you set your, uh, your levels too low in the analyzer, then you can overload the, uh, the analyzer, and it will give you false readings in the noise floor. It will look like distortions or, or beats coming up off the noise floor. But then also on the flip side of it is, is that if you if you have your uh, reference level to where it's set too high, uh, it's possible that you can uh, be looking at the noise floor of the analyzer, which is going to be a clean noise floor instead of the noise floor of the plant. One other thing I want to mention, if, uh, if you do have a... Uh, a, a spectrum analyzer, the 8821QR, and if you're and if you're wanting more detailed uh, training or an understanding on how to use uh, that particular analyzer, feel free to uh, to contact us at the support email address, uh, the uh, support at trilithic.com, or you're always welcome to post questions. We have a support forum at the uh, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash support dot trilithic dot com or you can always give us a call at the one eight hundred three four four twenty four twelve. All right, well hopefully uh hopefully y'all got uh got something out of this. I know that this went uh went very deep in some areas and then there were some areas that uh that I hit a little bit softer but uh, uh the analyzer is a uh it's a, a power pack of, of a whole lot of uh, different things, so it, it takes time to, to really learn how to use the analyzer properly. But once you do, you'll find that it would be a, uh, uh, one of your more useful tools for doing uh, uh, some in-depth troubleshooting. All right, thanks for attending.